Hello, my name is Luke, and welcome to this PyTorch tutorial series. In this video, we're having a look at the encoder decoder transformer architecture. If you're new to the channel, all the code you see here is available in my GitHub repo, link in the description. And this video is a part of a much longer PyTorch tutorial series. In the previous two videos, we looked at the encoder only architecture and the decoder only architecture. In this video, as I said, we're going to combine the two into the encoder decoder architecture and do some next token prediction. So if you look down here, we've had this diagram for the last few videos outlining some architectures that are decoder only, encoder only, or the encoder decoder. Now the encoder decoder architecture was, as you can see here, the original transformer that was used in the attention is all you need paper where we were doing, I think, language translation. So an encoder decoder architecture is commonly used for sequence to sequence processing. We saw the encoder only was used for something like text classification, where we combined the entire input into a single representation. For our decoder only architecture, we saw we needed to use causal masking in order to perform next token prediction. And now the encoder decoder architecture, we're gonna use the encoder to process some input sequence. And then we're gonna use the decoder to then generate a sequence conditioned on the output from the encoder. So to see how we're gonna combine the two, let's have an example. Let's say we've got the two sequences. So we have an input sequence, what is your name? And we have the output response, my name is Luke. So what we want to do here is we want the encoder to encode the input sequence and then our decoder to generate the output, my name is Luke sequence. So we know from our encoder only video that we will use self-attention in our encoder in order to build up our representation. So our self-attention will allow each of the tokens in our sequence to query each other. So they're all gonna query each other and we're gonna have some output embedding that we can then use for something. When we want to generate text with our decoder, we know we need to use causal masking or we need to mask the attention map of our self-attention to prevent a token from being able to query the next tokens in the sequence because we want to predict the next token in the sequence and we don't want it to cheat by simply looking ahead. In order to condition the decoder on the encoder sequence, we need some way to mix the information from the encoder and the decoder. To do that, we introduce a cross attention layer in the decoder block that will allow each token from the decoder to query every token or every embedding from the encoder sequence. So in that cross attention, every token or every embedding in the target sequence, the input to the decoder, will be able to query each of the embeddings from the output of the encoder, so like that. But in this cross attention, no keys or values will come from the actual decoder sequence. So none of the embeddings in this cross attention layer will be able to query each other. Only the decoder embeddings will be able to query only the encoder embeddings. So none of the encoder embeddings will query each other and none of the decoder embeddings will be able to query each other. In this way, we don't need to put any causal masking or any sort of masking here. So the first step is for our encoder to encode the input sequence. So we'll have our self-attention layer here. Same for every token in the sequence. Self-attention here will allow every token to query itself and every other token in the sequence. And then we'll have the MLP. And then of course we stack multiple of these blocks. The output embedding from this is the output of the encoder. We'll get one of these outputs for every token in the sequence, and we're gonna pass all of those to the decoder. For the decoder, we do something similar, but we'll have the self-attention with the causal masking, which again will prevent a token from querying the next tokens in the sequence. So my will still be able to query itself, but not name is Luke. After this is when we have the cross-attention. So we'll have cross-attention, and like I said, in this layer, my will be able to query the output of the encoder for you know, every time step. If we imagine we have embeddings for each of these time steps here, and we'll be able to pull information from the output of the encoder. And then we finally have our MLP, the feed forward part of our decoder. And again, that is a single block, and we'll have some number of these. Again, we'll have this for every time step in our sequence every token in our sequence. So if we look back at our diagram here, that's what we can see. We have our encoder, input embeddings, positional embeddings like we've seen before, our self-attention as per normal, and our MLP some number of times, and that output then goes to create the keys and values 
or that cross attention layer and the queries coming from the decoder. Again, that's our cross attention after our self attention or our masked self attention. And then we have our feed forward MLP. Again, we do the sum number of times before we output our probabilities for the next token in the sequence. In this example, we're going to be using the Yahoo Answers dataset again as our sequence to sequence processing. You could do something similar to the decoder only example in the last video, where you just have the answer and the question and some separator and just put all of that into our decoder. But it's more efficient if we know there's going to be some input sequence to encode and we don't want to have to feed the entire sequence into our decoder because we know we don't want to generate questions we just want to generate answers to our questions so i've already gone through the yahoo answers data set and how we're processing it same with the tokenizers and we've done that in the lstm uh, chatbot the lstm question answering so you can look through that if you want to cover that code let's just jump to the actual encoder decoder network so we know we have our sinusoidal position embedding to embed the location of the tokens in our sequence so i've broken up each section of our encoder decoder into its own and then dot module here this attention block is going to handle the attention mechanism for all of the different types of attention our self attention our masked self attention and also the cross attention and so it has a bit of uh, functionality there at the heart of it of course is just a multi-headed attention layer and the main difference really comes in the forward pass of this layer you can see we take in x in kv in and key mask in so x in is the input that will go to generate the queries for our attention layer kv in is the input that will go towards creating the keys and values for our attention layer and then key mask is that key padding mask we've seen before you can see we've defined a variable called masking so this defines whether or not we're going to do causal masking for this layer if we're doing causal masking we construct that causal mask as we saw in the decoder only video if not we just set it to none and we'll do no causal masking. When we do the forward pass of the multi-headed attention layer, you can see we provide X in as the query input and then KV in as the key and value inputs. When we use this in the encoder, we'll simply provide the same thing for X in and KV in. So they'll be the same thing. And when we want to do cross attention, we simply provide the output for the decoder as X in and then the output of the encoder for KV in. And finally, we have the attention mask and the key padding mask as well. So next we have the transformer block. And again, we're gonna reuse this for the encoder and the decoder. So it's gonna have a dual functionality. We just need to specify firstly, is decoder, is this a decoder block? If so, we'll add the cross attention layer. Masking equals true. Is the first attention layer in this block gonna have causal masking? For the encoder, it won't. For the decoder, it will. And that's really the only difference. And then finally, both block types will have our feed forward MLP at the end. If we look at the forward pass for this, you can see we take quite a few things in. We take in the input for this block, as well as the padding for this block, the key padding for this block. We take in the KV input, or so whatever the key value input's gonna be, and also the mask for that. So again, we're not querying the padding tokens for the KV inputs. So we do our forward pass of the attention, we normalize that setup in the initialization to either do causal masking or not. If this is a decoder, we then pass it through another attention layer. This time, you can see the query input and the KV input are different. So in the self attention, they're both the same, but if it's a decoder with a cross attention, we're gonna have the output of the decoder or the output of the encoder, passing the key mask as now the output of the encoder adding mask. Normalize, and then we have our MLP for both. For our encoder, it's very similar to our encoder-only network. We have our text token embeddings, the positional embeddings, and then we create our stack of those transformer blocks. Here, decoder is false, not the decoder, it's the encoder, and masking is false. That first attention layer is going to be self-attention with no causal masking. Forward pass, again, is very straightforward. Same with the encoder-only network. For our decoder, again, pretty similar to our decoder-only network. We have our text embeddings, positional embeddings as before. But now when we create our transformer blocks or our stack of them, decoder is true. We're going to create that cross-attention layer and masking is true. That first self-attention layer is going to have causal masking. In the forward pass, there's quite a few things. We have the input sequence to the decoder. Again, it's the target sequence. We have the output of the encoder. So we've done our pass through the encoder first and provided that to the decoder. And we have the padding masks 
for the input sequence and the encoder sequence. So we embed the input sequence of the decoder, which is the target sequence. We do the positional embedding, and then we go through our stack of transformer blocks, taking the embeddings, putting them as the input, passing the padding masks, and also passing the KV cross input as the encoder's output. We can do our cross attention. So combining them all together into our encoder decoder, we create both layers specified by the number of layers here, which is a tuple. In the forward pass, we have the encoder sequence, which I'm calling input sequence, and then the decoder input, which I'm calling target sequence, because it's also the target. We have our padding masks for both the, the decoder and encoder. First thing we do is pass the input sequence or the question in our case into the encoder. We embed or encode that sequence, and then we pass that as well as the target sequence to the decoder. Again, that'll do cross attention after the self attention with causal masking, and we'll get a prediction for the next token of the sequence. I think I skipped that in the decoder. We put that through a fully connected layer at the end there, and that'll give us our predictions for the next token in the sequence. So when we create our model, it's pretty straightforward. We define the size of the embeddings. We define the number of layers we want for the encoder and the decoder. Here we'll just do four blocks for each, and we'll have eight heads for each multi-headed attention layer. Onto the training now, it looks very similar again to our LSTM question answering. We have our question sequence in text. We have our answer sequence in text. We use our question and answer transforms to convert those into our token indices, put those onto our GPU. We have the input to the decoder, which is the answer. Here we just take all of the tokens except the very last one, which is probably gonna be the end of token sequence or padding or whatever. And that's gonna be the input to the decoder. And then the target for the decoder is going to be the same sequence, but shifted across one. So that's how we're doing next token prediction. We're using mixed precision again, just to speed things up, make it a bit more efficient. So we pass in the input or the encoder sequence, which is our question. We put through the decoder input, which is the target answer. And we get our prediction for the next token in our sequence. And we calculate our loss similar to what we did in the decoder only. Again, we're excluding the padding from the calculation our loss. We don't care if our model is predicting the padding. We don't want to include that in our loss calculation. So we do our backpropagation and update our model. And we're saving a checkpoint every epoch because this does take quite a long time to train. I think it takes about six hours for me at least uh, to train this for about 30 epochs or 20 to 30 epochs. So it does take quite a long time. Already trained this and so we can look at the results. You can see our loss goes down over time. I've trained this for over 300,000 iterations. I dropped the learning rate here a little bit because it started to plateau. I just did that manually. You could introduce a learning rate schedule to drop the learning rate over time. But now that we've got it trained, we can do some testing. So similar to the LSTM question answering, we can get a sequence from the test set. Let's look for a good question. So here we go, here's the question. Where can I find examples of mental or emotional discharge in World War II? Here's the original answer. So we can put this as an input to our model. So we have that input text. We pass that through the question transform, and we also create a start of answer token to prompt our decoder to start generating an answer. So if we look at the actual inference rollout, you can see we start our log tokens, which is gonna log all of the tokens in the decoded output. We start that with the start of answer token, so to prompt our decoder to start generating the answer. We put the question tokens into our encoder to get that first encoder sequence, and we only need to do that once. We'll concatenate all of the tokens in our list and then put that as the input, as well as the encoder sequence input. We'll then get our prediction probabilities from the decoder, and we can sample from that, again, scaling by some temperature. We get our next token, add it to our list, and then concatenate again. And we keep doing that till we've reached either 100 tokens or until our decoder produces the end of answer token, and then we'll stop. So let's run this and see what we got. We go, something about procreation. Try again, gives us a link to a website. Try again, you mean like sex? I'm not sure, quite sure what it is you're looking for, but I think those answers will make an interesting statement. Try again, do you really mean why? Someone has to explain everything to you, really. So you can see the type of answers we're gonna get, uh, the sort of answers you're gonna get from some online forum. Again, this was Yahoo Answers when it existed. So we can also put in our own questions here. For example, why the chicken cross the road? Why the chicken cross the road? The chicken cross the road. Try again. You could always run out of a loaf of bread to get to the other side. There you go. To make you think what the basic survival instinct to be taught, especially in school, a chicken crossed your path to the other side of the road, so he jumped straight. There you go. So you can play around with this once you've trained it and get some answers. The quality of the answers, even the quality of the grammar and spelling I've noticed, really depends on the data set 
can look through some of the original answers, you can see they're quite, sometimes they're a bit nonsense. So again, that's why you need to make sure your data set is good quality if you want to generate good quality answers, not just the model and the algorithm. Okay, so that's all I wanted to cover in this video. Hopefully you found that interesting. Remember to subscribe. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments and remember to check out our Discord for more information. In any case, I'll see you in the next one. Thanks.